beating the record in Baja felt like it might not be within the realm of possibility. I've been dreaming of this for so long and working and training for so long and part of me doesn't want to finish. My name is Marone Golfman. I'm an ultra endurance cyclist. I was born and raised in New England. I now call Alaska home. In 2016, our entire family was struck with the reality of my uncle Bruce being diagnosed with, with ALS. As a family member, you have to endure watching someone who you've known and loved your whole life slowly lose absolute autonomy and control of their whole body. Through a series of conversations that I had with my cousin Aaron and my aunt Rena, I felt compelled to, to offer to step in and support them. He called us up in September of 2020. He said, you know, I've got three months uh, that I wasn't expecting to have and I am willing to move in for three months and take over as Bruce's caregiver. And it was just an incredible act of love on his part. If you hadn't done that, I don't think Karina and I would have realized how much I needed the caregiving. Yeah. So. I had a feeling. I had a feeling. Following that fall of 2020, I went for a two-month bike tour of the Baja Divide. And it was during that time, and reflecting on my months with Bruce, that I came up with this concept to try to attempt a fastest known time in FKT from the US-Mexico border down to Cabo San Lucas and raise funds for the greater ALS community and those suffering from ALS. Baja, Mexico is the second longest peninsula on Earth, and the Baja Divide runs the length of Baja, kind of navigating its way from coast to coast all the way to the south end of Baja, finishing in Cabo. It requires a lot of navigational skills and having a GPS unit and ensuring that you're, you're on the route itself because it ties together a series of dirt roads and paths, blank beaches, and you know, you name it. Had just the most brilliant morning, whole first section through the night. It's wild to be back here and moving through the terrain so quickly. Anyone have a pose? I'm trying to, I would like to, to wash your bike? my bike, yeah. Oh, okay, let me have it. Yes. <laughs> It hadn't dried up enough yet, so hopefully that changes soon. Hopefully they didn't get as much rain as soon as we get down to the ocean, because, yeah, I'm working harder than I would hope to be. Up to that point, the longest ride I had done was four days. And so I knew that at best case scenario, I would finish in 10 days. So the gap there was, was really significant. Being a self-supported event means I can resupply, but under what would be publicly available. So meaning I come across a tienda, I go through town, I can stop at a taqueria, I can stop and stay at hotels. I couldn't call up ahead of time it can't be that people knew that I was coming, have things prepared for me, or that someone I knew would be able to give me any resources. Day two, my pace slowed down a lot from what I had hoped. And it's amazing how much your mental state is affected by whether or not you're kind of on pace.
So I did get a little lost on night two. And before I knew it, I was just like, what felt like in the middle of nowhere, very far off route climbing over barbed wire fences with my bike until I finally made it to the highway. And five miles later, I was, you know, in the town. I was back, back on route, and that put me behind schedule. I was telling you that my butt hurt when I saw you at lunch, yeah. or whenever that was. <laughs> that next session, I mean, we're talking like, my ass has been put to a meat grinder. Oh, I was like, how am I doing this right now? I like, couldn't feel my legs. I was a little bit worried, but I was going so fast, and I like couldn't feel my legs, and I was like, damn, this cool. Facing the reality that at some point we will lose Bruce, uh, it's heartbreaking. I could spend my life with ALS curled up in a ball and just ignoring it and eventually die. Or I can go out and try to do something useful, productive, so long as I'm helping a larger community. Fundraising is just one of them. To support patients and their families, to support research, to try to move things ahead with ALS and even just to raise awareness. Living through ALS is basically a daily endurance contest. It's getting from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And as you progress, that just gets to be more and more of an endurance challenge every single day. For years, I, I've dreamed of, of what it would be like to be an athlete. And I think what always held me back was this block of um, how do I give back? It was really through my relationship with Bruce that I saw the window in which I could do that, to be more than just an athlete for athleticism's sake. How can I not leave Bruce behind and take him with me and use this platform of ALS advocacy and the Ride to Endure project as kind of my mission as an athlete? Starting to feel, I'm starting to feel aware of asking your body to do a lot. You can see how swollen I'm getting. It's weird, my legs hurt. <laughs> That's crazy. start watching me actively suffer. My hands are really swollen. I can't really feel the handlebars. Mental state is in and out. I'm a little bit behind my dream pace, but I'm still on a good pace. Still on an FKT pace, potentially. It's the section I'm most nervous about. 
the whole route. So, fingers crossed, it goes smoothly. It's very hot today. There's no shade protection. It's just endless straight washboard road. It was really the first section that was just pure, just open desert, sun's beating down on you, and it was just painful because it's just nonstop washboard and it's bumping. You can hear this creaking sound. My bottom bracket is loose, and my multi-tool, the crank ratchet on my multi-tool broke. So I hope I can make this last 25 miles and not explode my bike. Day six felt like the crux day of the route. My bottom bracket just starts making a ton of noise and it's grinding. And then, but I'm pushing because I know that I'm getting to this next town and that's where the next resupply is coming. It's right about 10 o'clock. Day is not going well. Bottom bracket is still pretty messed up. My left leg is really causing me issues. I'm having serious Achilles pain and knee pain, making it pretty hard to pedal. Plus I'm trying to be really delicate. And pop, and then just the bottom bracket is grinding. Every pedal stroke I take, I feel like I'm just destroying my bike. Totally blew out my bottom bracket. I was starting to imagine a worst case scenario in that moment where I was like, I'm gonna have to get to the highway, I'm gonna get on the bus, I need to take it all the way back up to like Tecate where you know there's a bike shop, get my bike fixed, take the bus back down. Like I'm just about to lose two days. I was able to limp my way into the next town, Biscayanu. There are like three villages throughout the entire peninsula of Baja that have a bike shop in it, and one of them just happens to be Biscayanu. This is my bottom bracket. The bearing on the dry side just completely blew up. We have this. See all the little parts and pieces just completely blown out. Keep moving. I lost a little, unfortunately, I just lost a few hours, but hopefully, I can. This, I'm just, yeah, this next section's rough. Obviously, I was hoping it'd be a little further ahead by now, but um, I think you just gotta take the small victories when you get them. It was a really hard, it's been a really hard couple of days, really hard first half of the day. And so, yeah, the best thing now is to get a little sleep, get a really good night of sleep. I'm gonna get some clothes washed, eat some good food, eat, drink some beers and then uh, keep pushing on. It's really interesting, during the day I can do it. Like during the day I'm just biking and it works. But <sighs> nights are really hard. Mornings are tough too. It's pretty much how I remember it from last year. Nothing's really changed, except that it's a lot muddier. So, it just sounds like it, the conditions have gotten worse over the years. This is supposed to be a section I was guaranteeing or banking on going about 15 miles an hour. You can see those tires and it just goes on. Mm. 
Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely struggling to remember why I enjoy this right now. <clears throat> I haven't been sleeping. Which is crazy. It's like, how can you not sleep? And normally when I race, it's like, people talk about it being an issue, and I've never had an issue sleeping. But right now, my knees are causing me so much pain, and they're throbbing so bad. They're keeping me awake. <laughs> so I've been stopping and taking 20 minute naps. All right, I'm gonna go get some basic supplies. On a boat with you? It leaves at 9.30, that's when they tell me to be there. Okay. And yes, you can. Okay, that's far from ideal, but I'll do it. Okay. I normally start at 3 a.m., but... In order to like do the route that is on the peninsula on the far side of the Bay of Conception, you have to get a boat ride across the bay. I got into the town square and just by, you know, sheer fate, a cyclist comes over. Hey, I've been I've been following you along your route because I have my live tracker and he's like, I love what you're doing. I find out that he's about to take that boat ride the next morning, which would allow me to do the proper route all the way through. Yeah. Have a good Yeah. Gracias. one strong dude. Um, and he and he's aware. Um, and I think he's doing this for good reasons. It is day nine. It's been eight and a half days. Oh, I'm so tired of playing this game. Cruising as best I can. I mean, yeah. I don't feel good. Everybody's telling me how amazing I'm doing. I don't feel amazing, but I just keep going. That's <laughs> all I can do. At this point, with basically last 300 miles to go, it's 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 a it's a game of not stopping. So I will stop when I have to, and then my body tells me it needs to take a nap. I'll take naps, but I'm not like tonight. I won't stop for the night like I have along the route. Muddy shoes and all. I just generally put my puffy on and my little thin sleeping bag over my legs, and just will curl up take a nice dirt nap and then keep going you're passing ciudad constitucion and then from there the big push is all the way to la paz acres and acres and acres of pedaling through just these piles of, of burning trash that moment also really feels like the moment that you're leaving central baja you're truly leaving the mountains you're going down to the water and you're really heading into what is the final, final section of, of the route. Throughout this whole ride, I frequently was thinking back to my relationship with Bruce and being re-motivated by the memory of, of where this whole project started. 
I want to live a life that I'm proud of and that I have no regrets for. And that's really thanks to Bruce. Love you, Brian. Love you. This was your world tour. This is my world tour, 1981 to 1984. This is just a reminder to me that I once hiked 400 miles and 70,000 vertical feet. And yes, I could have done it once, even though now I can't walk an inch. You, you speak about when you were in your 20s and traveling the world and how much that feeds you and how much um, even as you have to face the reality of battling ALS, right? And that eventually it's going to take your life. It means a lot to me when you speak about the gratitude that you have that you did that in your life and that you can sit at peace with knowing. I am that. tremendously grateful for all the things I've gotten to do in my life. When I was diagnosed, it was an incredibly rude shock that three of my four grandparents had lived into the 90s. Today, my mom is still alive, 95 years old, and still living independently. And for me to suddenly hear, you're probably going to be dead by your early 60s, was just an incredibly rude slap in the face. But as I've thought about it over the years, yes, I've been able to do more in my life than most people who live into their 90s who have had some amazing opportunities. And I am grateful for that. Yeah. But as I've been going through this journey, there's also this real dichotomy that on the one hand, I accept that ALS is taking my strength. It's been very hard for me to accept that ALS will kill me. Hmm. I will admit in the past few months, I'm getting closer to accepting that because life is getting harder for me. Yeah. Particularly the breathing. Mm. That and I, it limits not just my speaking, but it makes eating much more uncomfortable. And I made the decision I will have no invasive measures. Mm. So I won't do a tracheostomy, I won't do a feeding tube. So when I come to the end of the line, on non-invasive technologies, that's it, I'm done. Yeah. And that may be hard to hear, but those are decisions I've made because I just wonder what would my quality of life really be if I started going with invasive measures. What's the point of prolonging? It's not the life that I want. I, I, I understand that and I respect that. I, I can only imagine how, how hard that is to... It's one thing to theorize, and then I imagine, right, as, as things are getting harder every day, that that doesn't feel so theoretical. It doesn't feel theoretical, but again, I can look at it in the perspective of my overall life. Hmm. I feel like I've had amazing opportunities, been able to raise two wonderful boys, I've had uh, some real impact, I think, in a variety of ways, professionally and with ALS advocacy. And I can go knowing that I think I've done my best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whenever that comes. The mental aspect is really hard now. I was pretty, pretty close to quitting. Being this close to the end, I think. this for so long and working and training for so long and, and then obviously the last 10 days have been excruciating and it's like this 
crazy in her battle. It's like, part of me doesn't want to finish. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine just finishing. And I'm obviously really proud of it. <laughs> but, this is, I knew that I was achieving the goal that I had set out to achieve, and I just had this final push to make, and it became so hard to complete the goal. It was like that literal 10% that was left. Time to bring it home. Leading up to and during the entire event, the only thing you imagine is crossing the finish line. And like, and then that moment is about to come. It feels quite surreal, and it almost feels impossible that you could allow yourself to like bask in the feeling that you've been working so long for. Hands down to this point in my life still remains like the most surreal moment that I've ever lived through was completing the Baja Divide. Because this race was so much more than just a ride, it represented so much more the response that we were getting online. So many people reaching out for the Ride to Endure project and the fact that it had so much meaning for other people, I mean, that meant the world to me. I think that for Bruce to have seen that while ALS has been devastating, that we would never wish this upon our lives, what that has inspired has been that his son, his nephew, have come together to start this charitable project that has had a really positive impact on the world. I know that that has meant the world to him. And to know that this is work that we intend to continue to do um, in honor of his legacy.